It's a joy to be here and not only share about GCM, but to share the Word of God. And uh, honored to uh, be trusted with the relationship to this church, this leadership. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Exodus chapter 14 is where I'm going to start this morning. It's kind of a jumping off point, uh, starting in verse 29. But the sons of Israel walked on dry land through the midst of the sea, and the waters were like a wall to them on the right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. When Israel saw the great power which the Lord had used against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. Father, I just pray that as we spend a few minutes in your word today, that God it would, it would just uh, cause faith to arise in the hearts of your people this morning to believe you for great things in their lives, in their community, in our nation, and around the world. God, on this uh, weekend of the 4th of July, we do pray for America. We, we do recognize the, the uh, severe need of our nation to turn back to you. And uh, God, we pray you would be merciful upon America in the name of Jesus. We pray for a, um, a new national awakening, which probably hasn't happened for about 50 years. I pray that God would be moved by your Holy Spirit upon our country. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Following... Uh, their miraculous deliverance from Egypt, Israel traveled for about three months, um, arriving at a place called Mount Sinai, where it had all began uh, for Moses when he encountered God's presence and power in the burning bush. So, I don't know, do we have a picture of Mount Sinai? Okay. All right, there we go. So, there you go. There's, there's a picture of Mount Sinai, and... Um, uh, uh, in, in this place called Mount Sinai, uh, today there is a monastery called the Monastery of St. Catherine. Uh, it was built at the foot of Mount Sinai in 530 AD, uh, about 1,493 years ago. And uh, let's go ahead and show the picture of, 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 that, of that place. And, well, that's just another picture of Mount Sinai. You can flip to the next Next slide. There it is. Okay. And so that, that's being used today. It's an Orthodox monastery right at the foot of Mount Sinai. Uh, Sinai was under the control of, of Israel uh, following the 1967 Six Day War. How many remember? Anybody old enough to remember the Six Day War? Some of you are, along with me. Uh, I was in Bible college at the time and, and uh, uh, thought the world was coming to an end, you know, as all these nations came against Israel, um, and uh, was dating my my wife at the time, and thought, well, this isn't going to happen. Well, fifty one years later, we're um, happily married still. So, <laughs> so there you go. Um, but but uh, in 1979, Sinai was returned to Egypt. So the Sinai Peninsula now. Uh, is under the control of Egypt and not Israel. There's actually a path uh, that leads uh, that leads to the summit of, 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 of Mount Sinai. Um, it's a 7,497 foot mountain, but there's a path called the Path of Moses that actually goes to the very top of the mountain, and people actually climb the mountain uh, to to experience that that path. Um, besides the burning bush experience. Uh, it was on Mount Sinai that God gave to Moses the Ten Commandments. It was also here that the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant were constructed. And in this, in this uh, uh, sterile desert, God provided food. And that food was called manna, which means, what is it? That's the meaning of the word manna, because it's... They had no idea. I, I, I wonder what it was made of, because that's what they ate for 40 years. I mean, you know, it had to have protein in it somehow. I don't know. It, it, I, I guess it looked like pastry, but it, but uh, whatever. 
Um, that's a pretty good pastry. Um, uh, it God also provided water for the people. You think about it, 2.4 million people. Uh, water for them plus plus all their animals. Uh, that's a pretty pretty huge calling. So the the um, the camp at Mount Sinai was three miles square. So so uh, you get kind of the idea of, about how big their camp was, and and uh, they stayed there for about two years. All right. So they weren't just there for for a, a few days or a few months. They were there for about two years, and. And, and then Numbers chapter 10 actually records um, when, when they began to leave there. It says, now in the second year, in the second month, on the 20th of the month, so we know exactly when it was, the cloud was lifted from over the tabernacle of testimony, and the sons of Israel set out on their journeys from the wilderness of Sinai. Then the cloud settled down in the wilderness of Paran, for they moved out for the first time according to the commandment of the Lord, through Moses. And then in the latter part of the chapter of chapter 10 of Numbers, it says, Thus they set out from the mount of the Lord three days' journey, with the ark of the covenant of the Lord journeying in front of them for the three days to seek out a resting place for them. The cloud of the Lord was over them by day when they set out from the camp. Then it came about when the ark set out that Mark, Moses said something which he would say every time the cloud would lift and the ark would move for 40 years. He would say exactly the same thing. Arise, O Lord. Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered and let those who hate you flee before you. Now, that seemed almost unnecessary, <laughs> you know, for him to say that. Uh, but I, I just want you to picture this, okay? So, so here, here, here they are. They're, the, the children of Israel are gathered behind uh, all their banners. So there's 12 banners, and all 2.4 million people are behind each banner with the leaders of each tribe in the front, and and and, and they're all standing there. There, the Levites raised the Ark of the Covenant, and 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 the cloud of the Lord, which had which had been over them for two years now, all right, all of a sudden begins to lift, and uh, and it's electric in the, in the, in, in the air, you know, the people are, are, are feeling this, this amazing moment as the cloud begins to lift, and, and all, as all of this is happening, and the people are ready to go, uh, Moses proclaimed, you can imagine how loud he had to do it, and in front of 2.4 million people. So, so there he's standing, and, and he, he makes this very simple statement, Arise, O Lord! Like I already said, it, it seemed almost unnecessary for him to say that, because God had been so faithful for them. God had spoken so clearly to Moses at the burning bush after Moses had spent... 40 years in the land of Midian, which literally was Saudi Arabia. So, so, so for 40 years, he lived in Saudi Arabia. He didn't live in Sinai. He lived in Saudi Arabia. He was in Sinai at the time during the burning bush because he, 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 they, were, they were always moving to other territory uh, to feed their sheep and goats and so forth. And so that's why he was at Sinai. But, but actually, he had lived in Saudi Arabia for those 40 years. And God spoke to him so very clearly out of the burning bush. And then, of course, he goes to Egypt, and, and, and Aaron, his brother, joins him. And, and all of the miracles that happened in, in Egypt where God shows himself so powerful. And, and, and then they leave Egypt. And, and when they're at the shores of the Red Sea, and, and, and it seems that all is lost because... The Egyptian army now has decided to follow after them and destroy them, and, 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 and they're at the shore of the Red Sea and have nowhere to go, and, and God miraculously delivers them. You read that story in Exodus chapter 14. And now they're in Sinai. They've been there for two years, and God has provided them food and water over that whole two-year period. But in spite of all of that, in spite of all that God had already done over and over and over again, by the way, how, how many of you can look back and see the faithfulness of God in your own life? Huh? Yeah, over and over and over again. We look back and we say, thank you, Lord, 
And we sing hallelujah, right? <laughs> Praise the Lord for all that God has done. But here, Moses, in spite of all that God has done, as he's standing there in front of the people, and there's the miraculous lifting of the cloud right in front of them, he still says, God, we need you to arise. By the way, that's a military term, which literally means, God, we need you to stand up and prepare to engage in battle. That's exactly what it means in the Hebrew. Okay. So for 40 years, whenever the cloud would lift, whenever the, the children of Israel would begin to move again, Moses said the same thing. Arise, O Lord. What? Why did he say that? What? What's that all about? You know, I, what I see in that term, arise, O Lord, is, 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 is I hear in, in Moses a desperation, an awareness of how much he needed the presence of God. No matter what God had done yesterday, no matter what they had experienced in the past, no matter all the miracles that God had already performed, today, now, in our situation right now, God, we need you to arise. We need you to stand up. We need you to go before us. That awareness, that desperate awareness of how much we need the presence of God. John chapter 15, verse 5, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. But without me, you can do what? Nothing. Without me, you can do nothing. Now, now I, I want to clarify, he's talking about fruitfulness here. He's not talking about you can't do anything without me. Obviously, you can get up, you can make your coffee, you can go to work. You can raise a family. You can do a lot of stuff, you know, on your own, you know. But he's talking about fruitfulness here. You and I cannot be fruitful <laughs> without him. And then I, I tell you, you know, I pastored 35 years, and now I've been with Great Commission Media for 16. And, and I tell you, I, I can look back and I can say, you know, anything that, that, that has happened that has been good <laughs> is all God. You know, over and over and over again with, with Great Commission Media, you know, because, you, you know, I'm kind of on the inside track of what we're doing. And, and a, a lot of times we, we plan these media campaigns and, and, and we go into poor countries where they have hardly any resources and we ask them to do what they can, but they can do hardly anything. And so, so the cost of a media campaign that may be $250,000, $300,000 all of a sudden falls on our shoulders and, and we don't have the money. You know, but God amazingly provides. And we've seen it over and over and over again. And what is that? That's that's not us, it's not because we're so smart or we're we, we got so much ability. No, it's 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 because God arises. God comes on on our behalf and and, and actually provides for us supernaturally. Absolute utter dependence on God to be fruitful. I think all of us want to be fruitful in life. You're not going to be fruitful on your own. You can only be fruitful with, with God arising. And, and Moses knew it, and, 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 and we know it. And, and Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, many of you know this. This is the word of the Lord. I, I like how that starts. This is the word of the Lord, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. He said that, in a very difficult time for Israel, and and, 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 and and so it is for us. It's not by might, it's not by power, but it's only by the Spirit of God. If we're going to be fruitful, if anything's going to really make sense of our life, if we're really going to be doing something that's going to be lasting, that's going to have lasting value for not only time but for eternity, it's because God arises on our behalf. Amen. How desperately we need Him. I hope you, I hope you feel that. <laughs> I hope you feel that sense of desperation. I hope you have that awareness that God, unless you show up, we're just we're just we're just kind of spending time here. <laughs> we're not doing a whole lot unless you show up. You know, we we need God to arise on our behalf. We need God to stand up. We need God to actually go. Before us, I, I love Second Corinthians chapter ten and verse four. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty 
through God. Through God. Mighty, not through you, not through Pastor Tim, <laughs> not through Dave Ogre, no. Mighty through God yeah. to the pulling down the strongholds. We want to see strongholds come down. Well, God is the one who's going to do that. We need to cooperate with that, but 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 God is the one who's going to bring that those kind of things to pass. And so we each and every one of us need to see God to arise. So what what is this message all about? This message is about us pressing in to the presence of God every day, every day, with a sense of dependence, with a sense of awareness that today, this day, July third, twenty twenty three, God, I need you to arise today. I need you to come on my behalf today. I need you to stand up. I think, I think, you know, the scripture says, you have not because why? Yes. You don't ask. <laughs> ask so that you might receive that your joy may be full. I am so grateful that God responds to faithful prayer. Not perfect prayer. Faithful prayer. And in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus talks about it. Ask, huh? and you shall receive. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. Okay? So, how many of like, when, when you were in school, how many really liked grammar? Anybody like grammar? I am so sorry. <laughs> I did not like grammar in school. I like history. I mean, I like history. Huh? Yeah, I like history. Uh, but, you know, I just put up with grammar. But, but grammar is important. Grammar is important here. So, so when Jesus says, ask, and you shall receive. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it is in the continuous present tense. Which means, ask, but keep asking. <laughs> seek, and keep seeking. Knock, and keep knocking. And you say, well, man, I've been, I've been, I've been asking for twenty. Years. Keep asking. Yeah. Don't give up. Don't stop. <laughs> Keep pressing in. Keep saying, "Arise, O Lord." Yeah. Keep lifting your voice to God on a daily basis, saying, "God, here I am again. <laughs> I'm asking again. I may have asked a thousand times before, but I am asking again today. Oh God, show up." Oh, God, stand up. Oh, God, move power. We're doing that. I mean, we, we got, Colleen and I, you know, we got prayer requests just like you do. Issues that we're believing God for. People that we're believing God for. That we're pressing in for. How many have people like that in your life? That you're believing God for right now? Keep it up. Keep praying. Keep believing God. Don't give up. Press in. In spite of all that God did yesterday, in spite of past victories and past miracles and times when you saw the presence of God in a powerful way, and yes, in spite of seasons where it seems that God is silent, where we're not seeing things happen to uh, prayers that we pray, don't give up. Don't stop. Keep praying. Years ago, uh, we were pastoring in Esterville, Iowa, Northwest Iowa, and um, we had a young couple come into our church. They came out of a drug culture and messed up lives, and they had two little girls, and they came into our church and came to Christ, and, and we were excited about that. We were young, they were young, it was fun having this new young couple in the church, and, and uh, and then we discovered that the wife had discovered uh, had had developed a certain kind of brain cancer that was inoperable, and she was going to Mayo Clinic. And Mayo Clinic said, "We can't do anything for you, but we want to we want to kind of follow your path, and and so we want you to keep coming back once a month, and we're gonna we're gonna keep testing you, just be aware of the progress of your condition." So she was doing that, and we were praying. And I was a young pastor. This was probably a long time ago, probably 1980, 1981. How many of you weren't born yet? Yeah. All right, many of you. 
<laughs> so, um, I was a young pastor, and I remember just crying out to God and said, you know, God, I really don't know how to pray, and I want you to show me how to pray. You know? And so, I really felt like the Lord spoke in my heart something real simple. It's got to be simple for neighborhood. So, so God spoke really simple to me. And, and, and this is what it was. And I just want to share it with you. Because maybe it's something that will kind of connect with you as well. This is what the Lord spoke into my heart. I have everything to gain and nothing to lose by maintaining a simple heart of faith. I have everything to lose and nothing to gain by fear and doubt and unbelief. Okay? So say it with me. I have everything to gain. Nothing to lose. By maintaining a simple heart of faith. I have everything to lose. And nothing to gain. By fear, doubt, and unbelief. So our part is what? Psalm 24. Our part is open the gates so that the king of glory may come in. So every day, every day, what do we do? We open the gates. Every day, every day, we say, arise, O Lord. You don't have to use a few words. You know, this isn't bibbity bobbity boom you gotta say the right words. No, this is a matter of, of, of simply expressing your heart of faith to the Lord, okay? Moses happened to use the word, arise, O Lord. God, we need you to stand up. You need, we need you to work on our behalf. But whatever, whatever words you use, the context of recognizing, God, we need you to stand up on our behalf is what it's all about. So we began to pray. I, I began to pray that. And, and, and let me, there was a miracle here, okay? Um, she was healed. I, I mean, she went to, uh, on, on a Sunday morning, uh, worship service, we, we had one of those services that I'm sure you have had many times where all of a sudden you just sense the whoosh, the sense of the presence of God. You just worship God maybe for a little longer than normal. That happened on that Sunday morning. And and, and, and back then, we, uh, we I don't think we do it anymore, but back then you'd, we'd stand at the back door and shake hands with people as they went out. People felt obligated to say that was a good message. That was a good message. <laughs> so, um, so, so I'm standing there, and people are walking out. And, you know, we're we're visiting, and 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 this young gal comes up to me, and she pulls me aside and said, "I need to talk to you." She said, and, and she's a brand new Christian. Isn't it wonderful that God, as as you were talking this morning, that God can speak to brand new Christians? Some of you may be convinced that God can't talk to you. You're not that difficult. You're not that complex. God knows how to communicate communicate to you in a way that you understand. Right. Moses needed the burning bush. You might think, well, I do too. I don't know. But, you know, God knows how to communicate with you. And, and, and during the worship service, God communicated to this brand new Christian and said to her, on this particular day, I'm going to heal you. So it happened to be her next appointment at the Mayo Clinic. She goes to Mayo Clinic, and, 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 and it's a half-day test. The doctors come back like, like they do at Mayo Clinic. They circle your bed with all the interns, and then and then the main doctor is at the foot of the bed. And the main doctor said, "I'm sorry, but we're going to have to do the test all over again." Didn't didn't give any explanation. So another half day of test. By evening, they come back. Sorry, we spent all that time, but the reason we had to do it is because we have all the documentation of what you had. We know exactly what your condition was. We thought something was wrong with our equipment because literally. What you had is now gone. And then he said, and we call that a miracle. <laughs> Isn't that great? Isn't that great? Now, now I in saying that, let me let me give the backside. I've also, as as pastor had, I've also had in 35 years of pastoring, probably hundreds of funerals. Some of very old people, but some of people that, you know. Mystery. Why? What, I don't know. I don't know. You know. So I'm not. I'm not sharing that testimony. You say, well, you know, you just pray the right way, and it's always going to turn out this way. No, 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 no. 
Can you know? I stand on Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to God, but that which he's chosen he reveals. He doesn't reveal everything, and we don't understand everything, and there's a lot of mystery to life. Why some get healed, I don't know. And why some don't, I don't know. But I'm not going to hold me back from continuing to press in every day, no matter what. I've got a granddaughter with cerebral palsy. She's 19 years old and in a wheelchair. I'm, I, I pray for her every day. And I'm not going to stop. I am not going to stop. And don't you stop. Keep pressing in. Keep standing on the word of God. Keep believing in God. Arise, O Lord. So it's interesting to me that David picks up on, on, on this cry of Moses. We see it three times in the Psalms. Psalm 3, Arise, O Lord, and rescue me, my God. Psalm 9, Arise, O Lord, and do not let mere mortals defy you. Psalm 68, Arise, O Lord, and scatter your enemies. So over and over and over again, David picks up on this phraseology of Moses, Arise, O Lord. Okay. Obviously, it was passed down word of mouth, all right, but also in writing, all right? So, so uh, generations later, they, they knew about the cry of Moses, arise, O Lord. When, when did Moses first say, arise, O Lord? I don't know. The scripture doesn't identify that. But for me, more than likely, he said it when he faced the lion and the bear. Huh? You know, as a young young man out in the field, I think you would have said a rise of war if you were facing a lion or a bear. You know, and 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 God helped him to 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 to, to kill both of them. Amazingly, it might have been when he faced faced Goliath and nobody else was willing to take him on, and 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 he he he's down at the brook and he takes five stones. I, you know, it was me. I would have said, God, I need you now. Arise, O oh Lord, I need you to stand up now, God, because I can't do this on my own. How many can relate to that? Now, we all face our own Goliaths. Hmm? We all face our own Goliaths. There's all kinds of Goliaths. You know, there's, there's, there's the Goliath of, of, of an abused child. You know, there, there are some people that 40, 50, 60 years later, are still impacted by what happened to them in their childhood. That's a Goliath in their life. For some people, it's, it's mistakes that they've made in the past that they can't change. That's a Goliath. And still, you know, Satan still shakes that in front of your face and say, what a, how stupid you were to allow that to happen in your life. For others, it's it's, it's a propensity or a bent towards some kind of an addiction, whether it be alcohol or, or drugs or pornography or whatever. That, that, could be, that can be a huge Goliath in people's lives. It may be a physical issue that you've prayed over and over again and, and, and healing has not yet come. It may be a child that is far from God yet and you, you keep crying out for uh, crying out to God, but you haven't seen that child yet come back. I, I pray for about 12 young adults who many of them are pastor's kids who are yet far from God to this day. I prayed this morning for a pastor friend of mine who, who's walked away from the Lord, pastored in Vermont, and now he's far from God. I went to visit him the last time I was in Vermont. And he barely would open the door to me. You know, I finally... I finally said to him, you gonna let me in? <laughs> and he did. But he, he's far from the Lord. These are Goliaths in our lives. Sometimes it's just silence, you know. We pray, we pray, we pray, we don't seem to get an answer. Sometimes we're facing major decisions and we need to hear from God and there doesn't seem to be that answer yet. That's a Goliath for us. What is my message for you this morning when we face Goliath? You keep saying, arise, O oh Lord. You keep crying out to God. You keep, you keep saying, God, I can't do this, but you can. I can't see victory in this situation, but you can. 
And so I am going to keep pressing on. I am going to keep calling out on your name. I am going to keep saying, Arise, O Lord. So let me wrap this up. And everybody said amen to that. I'm sure. Okay, 2 Chronicles chapter 5. This is a real important point in the life of Israel. David has died. His son Solomon now is king. That's an amazing story. I mean, Pastor, have you ever preached on, on that story? You know, the whole Solomon deal and I mean the mercy of God. I, I you know, I, I wouldn't have chosen Solomon. The second son of David and Bathsheba. I would have said, let's pick somebody else. You know, <laughs> we don't want to bring that subject up anymore. You know, but, but here, the mercy of God chooses this guy Solomon. It's amazing. He's brilliant. He's brilliant. And uh, David has provided so much of the stuff for the, for the building of the temple. And before he died, he couldn't, couldn't build it himself. God said, you got too much blood on your hands. I can't let you do that. So Solomon gets the opportunity to do that. Now, now, now the temple is ready. In 2 Chronicles chapter 5, it says, Thus all the work that Solomon performed for the house of the Lord was finished. And Solomon brought in the things that David his father had dedicated, even the silver and the gold and all the utensils, and put them in the treasuries of the house of God. And Solomon assembled to Jerusalem the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the leaders of the father's households, the sons of Israel, to bring up the Ark of the Covenant out of the city of David, which is Zion. All the men of Israel assembled themselves to the king at the feast, which is in the seventh month. Then all the elders of Israel came, and the Levites took up the ark. And so here they are. And David begins to pray. And he does what you don't want people to do before dinner. He prayed a very, very long prayer. Went on and on and on. You know, and, and finally, at the end of chapter 6, he's finished with his prayer. And this is what he says. Now, oh my God, I pray. Listen to this. Let your eyes be open and your ears attentive to the prayer offered in this place. You can pray that. Now, therefore, arise, O oh Lord. Arise, oh Lord. Don't turn your face away from your name. Remember your loving kindness. Now when Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering, and the glory of the Lord filled the, filled the house. The priests could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. And all the sons of Israel, seeing the fire, and the glory of the Lord bowed down on the pavement with their faces to the ground, and they worshiped, and they gave praise to the Lord, saying, Truly he is God. Truly his loving kindness is everlasting. So here, Solomon dedicated the temple, and he uses very simple words intentionally as he closes his prayer at the end of his dedication and he says, God stand up <laughs> arise O oh Lord and what does God do? fire glory the presence of God God responds when his people simply say I'm going to step back because I need you to arise. I can't do it, but you can. And I'm believing you to arise on our behalf. Father, this morning, we recognize how limited we are, how weak we are naturally, how little we can do, how many things we don't control but God, we serve you, and we will continue to press in. We will continue to remind ourselves that we have everything to gain and nothing to lose by maintaining a simple heart of faith. 
We will continue to pray, Arise, O Lord, in many different kinds of words, but that same concept of, of, of God, we need you to step up. We need you to step in. And we pray that all over again this morning. Lord, would you arise <laughs> on behalf of your people this morning? Would you show yourself strong? Would you break down strongholds? Would you open doors that no one else can open? May you make a way where there seems to be no way. Go before your people, God. Bring healing. Bring deliverance. Bring prodigals back. Heal bodies. Minister by your spirit. As we make room for you, as we open the gates, so that the King of Glory may come in. We trust you with all of our hearts, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. If you, this morning, I'm not going to ask you to come forward or anything like that, but if you, this morning, are here today, and you have a Goliath in your life, or in your family, or in your situation, it may be work-related, it may be physical-related, it may be family-related, it may be something else related, it may be related to your own physical issue, or something else, but you have a Goliath in your life right now. And this morning, you are willing to stand and say, God, I am believing you that you are going to arise in my situation. I just want you to stand, and I just want to agree with you in prayer this morning that God will arise on your behalf. You know, I'm really not surprised that we're, we're basically pretty well all standing this morning because, I mean, I mean, we've all got needs, we've all got burdens, we've got, all got issues. But if you're standing this morning, I want you to be aware today that God is proud of your taking a step of faith this morning, of saying, God, I need you to arise on my behalf. If you're comfortable with that, can you just raise your hand or your hands to the Lord? Father, we just surrender to you this morning. We acknowledge that without you, we can do nothing. How much we need you. If we step back and we say, oh God, when you arise, on behalf of your people, May you show yourself strong. I pray that you would do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or even think according to the power that works within us. And the power that works within us is simple faith that simply makes room for the presence of God. And we do that this morning. And we say, God, step up. Yes. God, stand up. Yes. We have a miracle. Break down strongholds in Jesus' name. Answer prayers that have been prayed for many people, some for years, Lord. We thank you, God, that you are God who hears and answers prayer. We will continue to ask, we will continue to seek, and we will continue to knock. Because we believe in you with all of our hearts. Would you just say, would you just praise the Lord? Would you just lift your voice to God right now? Just say, Lord, I just praise you. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, God. I thank you, God, for what you're doing, whether I can see it or not, whether I feel it or not. God, I claim that you are going to arise over our situation. If we give you praise and glory, we would not be like the nine lepers who, who took their healing and walked away. We'll be like the one Samaritan who returned to give thanks. We give you thanks. We give you praise. We sing hallelujah to you this morning. We praise you this morning with all of our hearts. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thanks for coming down to be with us this morning. Praise God. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be with you this morning. God bless you as a church. May God bless you.
May God keep you, may he make his face shine upon you. Give you his peace. In the name of Jesus.